Workers' compensation is an area of the law that many workers have limited understanding of. Today, we're going to be talking with Michael A. DeMeo of the law offices of Michael A. DeMeo. We're going to discuss what is called an impairment rating. So, Michael, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Well, Michael, what is an impairment rating and how is it determined? Cindy, generally when someone is injured on the job, uh, depending on their, the severity of the injury, they're going to be assigned an impairment rating generally by the treating physician and or physicians as a result of their injury. Uh, depending on the body part and the level of or the lack of ability to use that body part and or function uh, either in the workplace or in society, the impairment rating will be assigned based on their ability or more importantly their inability to do uh, and their normal functions of life and or job um, responsibilities. All right, now who assesses the impairment rating? Generally, the impairment rating is assigned by the treating physician, the primary treating physician. It, it is not uncommon for someone to have multiple injuries and have different providers, different doctors. And if that's the case, oftentimes we'll get an impairment rating, for example, to the back, maybe an impairment rating to a knee. Um, so you can have multiple impairment ratings uh, or you can have something called a whole body impairment rating which basically says that essentially the person is limited to a certain extent based on their inability to function or do work activities uh, overall. Okay, now Michael, what if the lawyer and or the client disagree with the impairment rating? Do they have any recourse? They do, and oftentimes, or at least I think almost in every case in our instance, we generally disagree with the impairment rating because it's assigned by uh, the workers' comp doctor who's obviously compensated by the workers' comp carrier who ultimately sends most of their clients to that particular doctor because they tend to give lower impairment ratings and they tend to indicate that the client can return back to work notwithstanding the serious nature of their injury. You are entitled in North Carolina to seek what's called a second opinion and get a different impairment rating. As a general rule, uh, we see much higher impairment ratings from providers that are not biased and not impacted by the fact that they are being paid by the workers' comp carrier. And in essence, what happens is you end up averaging uh, the workers' comp carrier's doctor and your doctor's impairment rating to generally reach a kind of a, a melded impairment rating. So for example, it's not uncommon for a client of ours to go and get a 10% impairment rating to the back. They would then go get a second opinion. It, and as an example, they could get a 30% impairment rating to the back. <clears throat> and then what would happen is for all intensive purposes, that rating would essentially be merged and melded and the average would be taken and that would probably generally be the agreed upon uh, impairment rating, which would be 20% obviously, given that example. Okay, now I assume that the impairment rating is critical to the outcome of the case. In workers' comp it is. An impairment rating is, is the end all for f factoring in basically the recovery because generally you're going to value a workers' comp case based on the impairment rating or a diminution in, in earnings, basically their inability to achieve the same earnings that they were achieving prior to the in accident occurring. So yes, an impairment rating generally is, is very significant. Obviously, if someone is permanently and totally disabled, then an impairment rating essentially would be 100% impairment. But yes, that is very, very critical on a workers' comp case uh, to have an impairment rating. If someone essentially does not have an impairment rating, they don't have uh, a compensable claim after the medical bills and the doctor's and the, and the two-thirds salary capped um, are paid. Basically, there's no additional recovery if there's not some sort of impairment. And obviously, we really couldn't add value to that case. So if someone's injury is, for example, soft tissue, or it's not going to have a permanency, there's not going to be some sort of surgical necessity, as a general rule, we will give clients advice and information to allow them to handle it on their own because we're not going to benefit them. Okay, well, Michael, this is certainly complex information. If someone has specific questions, how can they reach your firm? They can reach our firm in three, three different fashions. Uh, they can call us at toll-free anywhere in the United States at 877-333-1000. 
They can go to our website, which is DeMayoLaw, all one word, dot com, and there's certainly information there to either do a sign up or do an intake. Uh, there's usually an operator standing by to allow them to do uh, an intake or get some information. And finally, we have a third option. You can text our office uh, using the numbers 333100, which is an abbreviated uh, of our main number, and then put in the caption DeMeo, the name DeMeo, and then that person will be given some options uh, how and, and how to contact us or how we can initiate contact with them to further get gathering information and or help them in the representation of their case. Very good. Michael, thanks for your time today. Thank you, Cindy. This is Cindy Speaker for Main Street Law. Thank you.